I hereby introduce to you, Mr. Michael Veazey. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. I'm delighted to kick off uh, 2017 with one of the giants of Amazon. He's always uh, uh, ahead of the curve and uh, helping those of us behind him to, you know, to give us a hand up. And that man is Will Chen. Then, so Will, warm welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. That's great, great, great to be Fantastic back. Fantastic that you were willing to come back on. So, um, yeah, how are you doing? Where are you these days? Are you in Europe? Are you in, you know, in South America? You seem to be everywhere. I'm currently in freezing Minnesota. It's uh, the winter is just starting here, so it's getting pretty cold. But I'm heading out on Sunday out to Germany to speak at a conference, then hang out in Portugal for a bit. So I won't be here too long. Cool. That sounds like a yeah, sounds like a good decision. Though. It's pretty similarly freezing in London as well. I can tell you, it's not not pleasant. Um, so uh, let's talk about how you fund your amazing lifestyle and uh, what you're up to these days. So the the big word on the street, at least from you, therefore it's going to be the coming trend in 2017 is is all about uh, selling direct to Amazon and using things like Vendor Express and Vendor Central and AMS, all these buzzwords that we've got to learn yet another load of abbreviations and what the hell it means. So um, first off, just tell us a little bit about why it's a good idea to sell to Amazon. Why, why do it at all? Because it's new work, it's a new way of doing things. Um, I see it mostly as just inevitable where eventually Amazon does want to source and sell everything themselves. So if you can get ahead of the curve, if you can get on their side early, it's only going to help you in the future. And so it's kind of like um, any sort of thing where you know you're going to do it whatever three years from now, and you're going to ramp up to do it three years from now. But I always come in with the point of view that why don't you just do it today? If you know you're going to have to be doing it in three years, why not just be the expert three years from now when everyone is forced to do it instead of learning it new when everyone has to three years from now? Okay, excellent. Now, uh, what what's your thinking behind the, the statement that uh, it's inevitable? Um, because it's part of their game plan. If you read the Everything Store, Jeff Bezos' biography, he talks about it being the game plan that make it as easy as possible for third-party sellers to sell on their marketplace take care of all the annoying pain points like fulfillment and um, customer service and storage and marketing. And all they need is just us, a bunch of glorified sourcing agents to source all the best SKUs, see what sells the best. And then they start from the top and decide, okay, is this product easy enough to manufacture that we just want to come out with our own Amazon basics version? Or do we want to go and work with the biggest brands in this category and source all of their products directly? And so if you're not selling directly to Amazon, eventually they're just going to try to squeeze you out. And so third party sales are getting, becoming a bigger and bigger part of Amazon. I think it was over 50% of purchases um, were from third party sellers this last Christmas season. But from the different advantages that Vendor Central gives you and the different kind of heads up they give you and two, it's more, it works better with Amazon's business model. It's for sure the way of the future. Excellent. All right. So um, you differentiated there between Amazon Basics just going straight past us and going to the manufacturers in China, which makes total sense. And I know that they've been doing all sorts of things like building container ships and, and they've got a whole masses of offices out in China to cha- train the Chinese and how to export and all these scary things for us third party sellers on FBA uh, platforms. So, um, but the other thing you mentioned is sourcing from the big brand. So it, the game plan presumably is to become one of those big brands that Amazon will source off because it's easier for them to source from you than go to the Chinese. Is that the, the general idea? Yeah, I'm thinking that it's kind of, you just think of the general catalog. Like, think of like kitchen knives. Okay, so Amazon Basics can come out with like a, a block with like 10 knives in it for twenty nine ninety nine, And then there's going to be a bunch of like German manufacturers that have like real brand names. That so it's gonna the customer's gonna look at it and go, okay, do I want the thirty dollar Amazon Basics one that are basically just like kid knives, like play knives? Do I want the really expensive German ones? And then or do I want something in between or something that's not being offered yet? That's where as a private labeler you have an advantage to go and say, okay, I'm gonna have one that's a hundred dollars, so it's not the two hundred dollar block of knives, it's not the twenty dollar block of knives, it's still super quality. I make sure that all of our packaging, everything looks super nice, and Amazon buys directly from me because I fit a gap in the market that no other brand is currently um, taking care of. 
Okay, so you mentioned gaps in the market. I mean, it's obviously, in a sense, um, business 101 is to find those gaps. So how do you go about finding a gap in the market like that? So um, just before we say that, so just to clarify, you're trying to look for sort of to being the mid-price product, effectively, between the very established brands and Amazon Basics. Is that more or less the strategy? Or is that just not as... That, just, it just different every specific category. And so just for that specific category, that may be the best route to take it. And then two, think of it this way. When you jump on Vendor Express and you get upgraded to Vendor Central within six months and you're selling your knives directly to Amazon, then to whatever everyone else who's selling their private label, mid-level knives is going to get blown out of the water because yours is going to be shipped and sold by Amazon, okay. not, not like the rest of theirs. And so then two, three years down the road, you have way more reviews than everyone because you've been shipped and sold by Amazon. They do different sales and do different marketing things to push your product. And then two, when they go to jump on as a mid-market, say, knife, as an example, um, on Vendor Central two, three years from now, Amazon goes, no, we don't really want to order those. We already got a guy for that. Okay. So um, so where to go from here? The, the first question is then really how do you find out? We'll talk about what Vendor Express is and Vendor Central in one sec. How do you go about finding the basic sort of products? You know, you were talking about gaps in the market. How would you go about finding gaps in the market, which are good candidates for this kind of business model? So I've been doing kind of a roundabout way, which is interesting because um, first and foremost, I've been looking for like big name brands who have terrible Amazon accounts. And I go and consult for those companies. And say, hey, I'll run your Amazon account. All of your listings aren't optimized. A ton of SKUs are out of stock. There's all sorts of different violations going on. Like, let me fix this for you. They're not even selling currently on Amazon themselves. I go sell on Amazon, take over their listings, and fix everything. And then from there, I've been using these bigger, larger companies I've been working with as my private labeling arm. And so then I go, hey, you make a ton of kitchen accessories why don't you make this kitchen accessory? And they go, that's a good idea. We own all of our factories over in China. We should make that kitchen accessory. And then they go and fly over to China two weeks later and source a sample and buy every product on the first page of Amazon as a comparison. Okay. And so it's like I'm looking for basically right now at the time being, I'm looking for kind of in the niches of, that we're already consulting for for these bigger companies, let them handle all the kind of research and development. And basically, I'm just looking for something that's like within their wheelhouse, but at the same time, they're not being manufactured yet. So, hey, you guys make 40 different types of plastic um, like ladles for soup. Why don't you guys make a slotted spoon? That seems like it's right up your guys' alley. I looked at the market, the revenue to review ratio. So if you use like Jungle Scout, you type in slotted spoon, say it has 10,000 total reviews, but $100,000 total in sales a month. $100 to one review is a pretty good ratio. So I go, okay, there's not too much competition. It's right up your guy's alley. It's just one more skew to add on. And there's proven sales. It's $100,000 in total sales a month on the first page. There's only 10,000 reviews total. So there's still some opportunity for us to get in there. There's still some meat on the bone. You guys can probably source it cheaper than everyone. So a combination of everything. So it's never like a straight path to how I find these products, it's always like, oh, this keeps checking off the boxes one after another. I'm trying to play devil's advocate, but basically I can't find anything wrong with this niche of this product. So it's worth at least a shot. So the first thing you do is in a way try to, I mean, it's a general product picking approach and you try to find, try to pick holes in it. And if you can't, you think it's a watertight product then basically. Yeah. So first and foremost, I've really been kind of um, using my new like revenue to review ratio as kind of a crutch just to really quickly see what where the product is in its life cycle and uh, how mature it is and then from there if i can say okay it looks like it should be easy to ship it looks like not if everyone on the first page is being sold by amazon already then i probably am too late to the market you know there's a bunch of different things that i kind of check off my list to make sure okay this doesn't have anything wrong with it it seems like it has this upside there's very little risk might as well pull the trigger Okay, yeah, so high upside, low risk is, is always the sort of golden thing that we're looking for, isn't it? So what other criteria would you say? So revenue to review ratio is an interesting metric. That's not one I've heard before. That makes a lot of sense. But um, what other things that are okay? Easy to ship makes sense. Have you got any other sort of main criteria that you tend to use for things like that? Um, I, I prefer if it's a product that I have to explain to people what it is, like it's that niche down. Okay, 
So you don't find that that's going to lead to like more negative reviews from people who don't know what the hell they're doing with it? Because I know that that's one of those downsides to an unusual product. Oh yeah, no, so it wouldn't be. It would be. It wouldn't be unusual to the person who's within the niche. Okay. So it'd be like, um, this is a a little tool that's only made for cutting fly fishing rod lines. Nice. And so yes, it's a weird product, but it's just a little piece of metal with a little blade in it. It cost me fifty cents. Guys buying for ten dollars. No, yeah, they're they're simple. And yeah, do I sell a crazy ton of them? No, I sell ten a day. But I have zero competition. I make eight bucks a unit. It's great. Yeah, that makes total sense. And there's a huge ROI on that. So that that makes total sense. And also, yeah, I like what you're saying. That's a very clear minded way of putting it. So to the person within the niche, it's really clear or niche, whatever you say, um, is really, really clear what they're looking for. But somebody outside, you'd have to say, what, what the hell is that? But that's nice because it's not an obvious thing. It's not going to come up on other private label sellers radar. Makes total sense. So now let's let's come back to this question of, um, well, one, one thing real quick, Mike, um, two with the products, it always has to have a very specific keyword that the customer searches for. That's like another thing that's like a mandatory thing because, um, I had a woman recently at a conference come up to me and say, Hey, I want to sell these Bluetooth wireless noise canceling headphones that you can sleep in. And I go, okay, now how's the customer going to find that? And she goes, maybe searching Bluetooth sleeping headphones that are wireless. Yeah. And I go, well, no one's going to search that. Let's be real. It's too specific. So, like, yeah. Exactly. And then two, you can't rank for Bluetooth headphone. You can't rank for wireless headphones because all these are going to be super saturated. So like, she didn't have a specific keyword in mind that she wanted to target. So she couldn't even do the revenue to review ratio because she didn't even know where, where she wanted to start. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so again, it comes down to really we're searching for keyword niches first and foremost and then products that fit that secondly. Is that a fair summary? Yep, and so like um, we I just got recently got into climbing, and there's a a metal tool that you use to put your rope through called like a gri gri, like G R I G R I. All right. Now, no one knows what a gri gri is. If you're in mountain climbing, everyone knows what it is. Okay. And two, how hard is it to rank for this very specific term G R I G R I? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like no one else is going for that besides me. And so it's like anyone who searches it knows exactly what they're looking for. They want to buy. Anyone who doesn't search it, good. Because no one knows it exists. And then two, if no one knows to search it, then that means no private labelers are sitting there nipping at my ankles, searching the same thing, looking it up on Jungle Scout. Yeah. Except now. <laughs> Suddenly when they listen to the podcast, but yeah. Oh yeah. Take all my ideas. I got plenty. Don't worry. Yeah. 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 But um, that's a very, very good point. So I think that's a very neat little strategy because it, it basically eliminates most of the competition and also the presumably the conversion rates are really high because the people are looking for it know exactly what they want. Yep, and it, too, it works with um, U.S. brands really well where I go and contact these um, climbing brands that are U.S. Well, they've been in the niche forever, so they're selling these whatever harnesses for $140 when they sell them wholesale for 40 you know, because they got this established brand. So again, no one knows whatever um, Black Diamond climbing equipment, but everyone who climbs knows exactly who Black Diamond is. They're the Nike of climbing. Okay. And so when someone searches them on Amazon, they're going to go, wow, they have the whole entire Black Diamond catalog. This is amazing. No one ever has this. And from my point of view, I go, wow, this is even easier to source because I didn't have to do any research and development or anything. I may still make the huge margins. And all I have to do is place an order once a month with this U.S.-based distributor. Sounds amazing. So tell us about the obvious question next is, and how do you start developing relationships with the uh wholesalers and distributors and the other one i wanted to ask is about the capital requirements because obviously you've got to be real about who this is right for so with the u.s distributors a lot of them actually have very very small um minimum order quantities okay the one i was talking to um that would sell like ufc gear um they said that the average yearly order volume from one of their distributors was twenty five hundred dollars okay so that's really pretty that's like tiny yeah, yeah, 2500 for the year. It's like, come on. So you order $2,501 and you're in the top 50% of their resellers. Like, that's pretty sweet. Um, so, but the way I find them is just searching through Amazon. If I'm sitting there looking at climbing stuff and I notice that all the established brands have three of the five bullet points filled out, everything's not, not in stock, or maybe they're not prime, maybe they have one of the five images, 
all sorts of stuff like that. Maybe they have 50 people competing for the buy boxes at 50 different prices. All sorts of these things are signs to me that their, their Amazon account is being managed poorly. And there's, they, they don't fully understand kind of the Amazon ecosystem. And so it's easy enough to call up these companies, click the contact us, become a distributor on their website and say, hey, my name is Will Turnland. I sell on Amazon. I consult for Amazon for a living. I just wanted to give you a heads up that I was going to buy your product on Amazon as a customer. And I noticed that everything's a mess. I don't can't figure out who I'm buying from. I can't figure out what price is the normal price. Is is this color? Do you even sell this? Is or is this obsolete? Is this? It says it's blue in the description, but it shows black in the picture. I'm just kind of confused as an Amazon customer. So like, let me know if you need any help getting your Amazon account straight. That's kind of the, the, the spiel you want to give them just kind of as like a soft opening. And then from there, you kind of want to transition into, okay, make me the only distributor of your product on Amazon. I can make sure that I don't screw over any of your brick and mortar accounts by selling the product too low because there won't be anyone competing for the buy box. I will keep all your product in stock. I'll always pay you up front, like all these kind of things that you can just promise them that the other distributors can't promise them and say, okay, all these other people are selling on Amazon or just using you and just taking advantage of you and not adding any value to your company. Well, I can actually add value to your company because I can keep the price high. I can keep everything in stock. I can optimize the listings. I can make sure that the PPC is set up correctly. Well, everyone else is kind of out for themselves. I can actually be like a member of your team. And so I'm basically a A plus consultant for this brand, but at the same time, I'm paying them instead of them paying me. Nice. Okay. So that's a pretty powerful proposition. Because obviously, number one, they're getting paid by you. Um, but then also you, they, you're, you're right. At least your pitch is that you're on their side. And I guess you kind of are because if you're protecting their, um, their price for starters, I mean, that's going to be great for everybody, right? And two, it's, it's in my best interest to make their listing as pretty as possible because I'll get the most sales possible. Yeah. And then two, it's in their best interest too that like, oh, now instead of having three bullet points f filled out in one picture, now we have six HD pictures. They're all zoomable and the bullet points are all say exactly what we want them to say. And so I put it from the point of view of with these brands, would you allow your product to be sold in Target or Walmart if you didn't know who was selling it at what price or what the packaging looked like? No, that would, you would, you wouldn't be able to sleep at night. Yeah. But instead this happens every day on Amazon and you just don't, don't even blink an eye. Interesting. So these big, uh, well, I can say big, I mean, actually, as you said, the dis distributors, uh, sometimes seem to be taking pretty small orders, but, um, these established companies, established brands don't really have much of a clue on how it sounds almost like they don't understand e-commerce, but they certainly don't understand Amazon because they'd have a, very established way of doing things in stores that's very controlled. I mean, physical yeah. stores and they have a very uncontrolled online presence. So you're basically offering, I'm just trying to think of the, the how to appear well, to their mentality. Uh, ima imagine this from their point of view. Yeah. So you're a mountain gl climbing company and you specialize in making the best carabiner out of anyone. So you've been doing this since 1975 and you have 10 people who work in manufacturing one person in accounting, one person in HR, and then like five people in sales. Each person in sales has their region of the United States and they call up outdoor shops and mountain climbing shops and say, hey, do you guys wanna place an order? Hey, do you wanna place an order? Hey, do you wanna place an order? And their whole job for 40 years was to get as many accounts under their belt as possible. Okay. So that means sales, right? And then all of these distributors now start selling out the back door on Amazon. Okay. And so before they know it, they now have 40 people selling their product on Amazon. They go, hey, we told all of you you only could sell in your stores. We sell on our website and in your stores and nowhere else. Now our products are being available on Amazon. Well, we've been selling to the store for 40 years, so we can't just cut them off. But at the same time, selling on Amazon is actually kind of screwing over our business. Now what do we do? Interesting. Okay, so basically, the, the, their business, their mental model, if you like, of sales is that the more sellers, the more resellers or retailers they have, the better. But suddenly, that is the opposite is true on Amazon, really. 
Exactly. And so if the brick and mortar stores, for the most part, add a ton of value because they keep it on the shelves, they educate the customer, they upsell the customer to get them to buy accessories. Like they actually add a lot of value. But the second they start selling out the back door on Amazon, that's something anyone else can do. And that's not really adding value to their company anymore. And so that's why with some of these companies that are still kind of old school and don't get it, you can call them up and say, hey, my name is Mike. I'd like to buy $3,000 worth of your product. And they go, sold. Where do you want me to send it to? Because they're still in that become a distributor to anyone model. Yeah. But the the smarter ones will go, wait, 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 where are you selling this product? Because we're not supposed to sell to people who sell on Amazon anymore because we haven't figured out that problem yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then and the, the so what do you say the, to those guys then? When the problem is these brands, they have no idea about anything. So they're just contact like seller support and say, hey. Tell people to quit selling our products. Only we should sell our products. And seller support will, someone from India will email them back and be like, what are you talking about? Right. So basically, yeah, tell me about that. Because I mean, I am naive about this in the sense that I've mostly done private labels, so not much retail arbitrage. But presumably, you can just sell pretty much any brand on Amazon it's Any not time, technically right? retail arbitrage because you're not buying it at retail prices. No, but, but yeah, but um, yeah. So it kind of depends. So there is some gated brands out there like Nike or Louis Vuitton or something that you just can't sell. Right. Okay. But for the most part, a lot of these you can just click the like I have one to sell to button on Amazon. Okay. And so then you go, and then once you um, it's just every brand's different what they kind of want. But to say if they want no one else selling their stuff, you can go in and actually like gate your brand and go in i was just filling out the form yesterday and you have to get like put your trade your u.s trademark number your like whatever your business id all this different information that they need to prove that like you're the business owner and blah 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 but then from there you can basically um <clears throat> you can basically gate your brand and get approved eventually and just explain to amazon that customers are getting hurt because your products keep getting counterfeited and that you're only doing this out of desperation to um, like help the customer's experience. And as long as you always kind of frame it in the customer first type of way and use the word counterfeit, Amazon usually is um, more likely to kind of answer your emails. Interesting. Okay. So basically what, what would you do? Uh, you would, would you be the person contacting Amazon about that or would you persuade a brand to contact Amazon and make you the exclusive distributor? It, it, it literally I just get on the phone with these people and I know there's some sort of money to be made yeah and so I just kind of just ride whatever the where the conversation takes me okay so if I'm getting that hey they just want me to become a distributor they don't want me to do anything else that's fine then I just go done if they go hey they want me to become a distributor but only if we can make sure we keep the price high then that's a different conversation if they say hey I want you to run our Amazon account for a percentage of revenue but it's all going to be under our EIN then that's a different route. You know what I'm saying? So it's like every single time the companies want to do something a little bit different. And they, I, I kind of just always say yes, because most of their times they, the stuff they ask for is fairly simple things. Okay. That makes sense. You're very flexible in your approach of what you offer them. You just go with what, where the conversation takes them. But your basic pitch is really simple that you're going to kind of clean up things on Amazon, keep their prices high, um, and improve, yeah, sales and conversion generally make them more money, yeah. I guess. Well, if they, if they get to $20 million a year in sales on Amazon, then they're making enough money that they can go hire a whole team. Yeah. But until then, it's like, do you really want to go hire and train three, four people when you don't even know what to train them? You don't even know who to hire. Do you want to just hire me and my team? Because we do this for a living. We won't ask any questions. We know exactly what information we need. We can just get the ball rolling instead of wasting six months kind of trying to upload an image correctly. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're basically offering your Amazon expertise and then they stick to what they know and you're saying, well, let, let me just be the sort of Amazon front end for your company, basically. Exactly, exactly. It's basically, it's like Amazon is this big kind of spooky monster in retail. <laughs> yeah. And instead of them trying to deal with it and all that kind of stuff, I'm like the perfect kind of like band-aid on the wound where it's like, hey, you're, you're sick of Amazon. You don't want to deal with it anymore. You're, it's just not working with your business model. Just hand over that part to me. You won't handle any returns, any customer service, anything. I'll handle it all. And all you guys do is get a check. Nice. Yeah, that sounds like it. That's always great. I'll handle it all and you get a check. Uh, is always a fantastic pitch, right? 